do you have? So you're our assistant. Yes. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Let me see. I think they can do a little bit of work on the Sorry for um yeah for the woman in question. Yeah, no, exactly. What did I miss? Um, I went in Test one, two, test, test. Test one, two, test, test. Having <laughs> dinner at my
I think um, this is a good moment to start. Um, we are still working on some final technical adjustments, but in terms of substance, we can of already go ahead, I think. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this session on EU copyright reform. Um, well, from our perspective, and at this Congress, this is the public interest perspective, of course, um, we think that there are several issues in this reform agenda that are quite worrisome, actually. So the idea underlying this session is to map the different issues, the different aspects, um, and we will do this in several stages. So the first step is we look into the proposal of an ancillary right for press publishers, a neighboring right, you could say, and exceptions for text and data mining. After that, um, we will dive into the area of exceptions and limitations first, with a focus on exceptions and limitations for educational purposes, libraries and archives. And then in the final session, we make a step to freedom of panorama, user-generated content, and the debate about the neutralization of the safe harbor for hosting in the area of copyright. I have a wonderful um, list of speakers in order to bring all these different issues here into our debate, and I will introduce them in the different steps that I have just announced. So for the first session, I have uh, Stefan Kompel from the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam, and uh, Thomas Magoni from CREATE University of Glasgow. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will first uh, briefly introduce uh, what, what is proposed uh, as the ancillary right. Um, in Europe, a proposal is currently pending to introduce a new intellectual property right for press publishers. Um, and this would give the publisher of these press publications a set of broad exclusive rights to control the digital users of their press publications for a limited period. In the original proposal, it was 20 years, the Commission proposal. The European Parliament suggests five years, the European Council suggests one year. But that's the, 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 the core of the right is that these press, press publishers get uh, exclusive rights to control the digital users. And what is very important to note at this point is that 
all the three institutions, the Council, uh, the European Parliament, and the Commission, they have all defined their negotiating position, and that appears to be very close. So, although it's still a proposal, the fact that these institutions are close uh, in their opinion on the press publishers' right means that it might actually be very near that we will see a new publishers' right arising in Europe. And that's despite fierce opposition by many academics in Europe, including some of which are in this room and on this table, actually. Um, so what will happen, uh, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but the, the fact that they're negotiating in this fall uh, about this, uh, this proposal uh, might mean that we, uh, we might see it early uh, next year, uh, the press publishers' rights or the whole corporate and digital single market proposal being adopted. So what I want to do briefly, explain why many academics are against this press publishers' right, um, uh, and, uh, 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 and to, to understand really what's here at stake. Um, first of all, sketch the background. We all agree, I think, that uh, 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 due to the digital environment, we see newspaper publishers struggling. And they struggle in, both, in two sides. Um, they struggle to cater to the uh, market of readers, on the one hand, and they struggle to cater to the market of advertisers in the digital environment. And why is that? That's because we consume news in a completely different way than we did 15 years ago. So we don't read newspapers anymore on print, we read them online, we read them on our devices. So the, 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 the sale, the turnover, the revenues from, from print have decreased significantly. On top of that, we also see that actually the advertisement market has changed. The advertisement market has moved completely from the newspapers or the, the, the press publications to the digital environment. They, they want to publish on Facebook. They want to publish on, on where consumers consume the news. And this also leads to a loss of advertising revenue. So everyone agrees, there is no doubt about that, that actually press, publications, press publishers see a decline in revenues. And what we then see is that they have less money to invest in quality news, and therefore they say, we need a new IP right to cover that. But that step is not logical. And that's immediately the first objection against the proposal. How can an IP right cure the core objection, or the, 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 the intrinsic difficulties that press public publishers are facing, the, 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 the consumer, the change of the consumer, uh, uh, the ch change of consumer focus on news and the advertising market. Um, and especially given that press publishers already enjoy copyright in press publications. They get this, uh, uh, the, the copyright transferred to them by journalists, by photographers, etc. And that alone should be sufficient to protect their interest. If they already own copyright and news publishers, why do they need an additional layer of IP rights to save them? Um, so the first objection is there's simply no need for a new additional right if they already enjoy copyright in their press pub publications. Um, as a second thing, I already mentioned it, does it really save the intrinsic problems that the, that the, the press is facing? Um, no, uh, the introduction of a new publisher's right will not change the advertising market. It will not change the way that the consumers read news, which are the intrinsic drivers of the problem. And the, the assumption that, that this new right is needed so that we actually can reinvest more and more money in quality news is also not given. Uh, uh, first of all, it suggests that more money will be available. We have no idea whether that's actually the case. It's very doubtful. And if more money will become available to press publishers, who will guarantee that they will invest that in quality news? We have no idea. Um, and if you really look at the, 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 the claim that it would be good for media pluralism, that's very questionable if you look at it uh, on a more deeper scale. Um, because examples uh, of a press publisher's right that exists in, 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 in Germany and Spain show that it might actually have a bad effect on media pluralism. What, what happened there is that uh, 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 in those countries that do already have a press publisher's right, uh, many news aggregators, including Google News, stopped providing access to newspaper content of, of, the, of the, 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 the local uh, uh, press uh, publishers at least less than they did before. 
And that's especially so for the smaller uh, uh, news publishers. The bigger they still refer to. But anyway, we've seen in these countries there is evidence that uh, uh, the press publishers' right negatively affected accessibility of news online and in fact led to a fall in referral traffic to newspaper websites, especially those of the smaller newspapers. Then the third objection is that the whole proposal, if you think about it, might actually be bad for journalists and authors. In increasingly, these authors and creators, they work um, as freelancers. And for them, what is needed is that they have to establish a name and reputation. And therefore, for them, it's essential uh, that, they get, that, they need max, that they get maximum exposure of their works. Um, and a press publisher's rights might hinder that. If you give the, 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 the exploiter as such an exclusive right, they might hinder uh, that, uh, uh, that exposure that they now have in the online environment. And on top of that, uh, we have no idea how, how this proposal might affect their bargaining position. Um, there is no guarantee that after this right uh, uh, is introduced, more money will become available. And that means that if the pie will not grow, the fact is how this will be redistributed, this money, if press publishers enjoy an exclusive right in their own name. So that might actually mean that less money will be available for the creators. And the last point is, uh, uh, and we still don't know what the shape of the proposal might really look like. I already gave the example of the term protection that we are, that's not guaranteed yet. But in general, um, if we see this, uh, this exclusive right for press publishers, doesn't it go way beyond what they actually require? They require that they can enforce their rights in an online environment. Why do we then need to give them broad exclusive rights, rights which I already said they own? Um, so if the idea is only to allow them a certain share of the profits that news uh, aggregators make in the online environment, um, the, the, the point is they can already do that probably on the basis of the rights that they own. Uh, and second, uh, uh, I don't think that you need to give them broad exclusive rights of reproduction and communication to the public in the digital environment. Also, if you think about the term of protection of one, five, or 20 years, whatever that might be, that's pretty long for news. I know that in, uh, in, 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 in the US there is this, uh, this provision of the news of the day. I think it's a 24-hour protection uh, for really uh, exclusive news. But one, five, or 20 years, that goes way beyond the commercial lifespan of press articles that are relevant for a day, maybe a week, but not much beyond that. So many academics in Europe believe that the proposal for the press publishers' right is flawed, uh, that there's no evidence that it would actually help the, uh, the, the press publishers. And there are uh, 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 grave concerns whether this will, uh, what this will do to the media pluralism in Europe. And therefore, uh, uh, we as academics have called upon the European legislator to be cautious. Um, there was a, a, a small success in July where the European Parliament uh, put a halt to the, to the negotiations, but as many of you might know, in September they actually approved the text uh, that was adopted, at least for the negotiating position, so we now will see the, the negotiations going ahead. And uh, the only thing that might be, safe, uh, might be safe if we get a blocking minority in, in the Council, or if Parliament will stop it at final reading in when the, the, the trilogue comes to the conclusions. For uh, this introduction to the press publisher side, we stay in the area of literature and it's extended a bit with data. So Thomas, you give us an introduction to text and data mining. Thank you. Have uh, some slides. Um, so uh, I'll be focusing on uh, what is Article 3 of uh, the current proposal, um, which focuses on uh, text and data mining exception. So we'll do this very briefly, taking two different points of view. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I'll basically describe to you how the article looks like, what are the technical features, and whether we like them or not. Um, and then I think uh, it's very important, however, not to lose the more general view and uh, you know, questioning why we need a tax and data mining exception in the first place, because uh, 
if we have, to anyone who has studied copyright law at some point in their copyright 101 course, someone should have told them that international treaties and copyright theory tend to say something along the lines that data as such, facts, uh, methods, principles are not protected by copyright. So if they are not, why do we need an exception? Let's go in order. So Article 3, um, I think there are five main elements that I would like to identify. Um, the definition of tax and data mining, the scope, the beneficiaries, the relationship to contract, and the relationship to technology. Uh, regarding the definition, I would say this is one of the elements where we don't have many uh, objections. It is a general enough definition that co includes most of the activities that we could classify under tax and data mining. Um, it is important to point out that uh, this exception uh, will be mandatory, which it is another uh, important element, uh, positive element in the proposal. So it will mean that the exception will apply in all 28 member states. And if you're familiar with EU law, you know that this is actually a very important element because of the 21 currently available exceptions, only one in fact is mandatory, the other can be uh, cherry picked is the usually employed expression. Uh, but I'm afraid that the good news uh, uh, stop here. Um, regarding the scope, uh, um, it's very narrow. It is a scope. So this is again maybe quite clear for European copyright uh, parlance and maybe a little bit less for US, but we tend to combine an exception to a specific right. So once we look at the exception uh, in Article 3, we have to keep in mind that it is an exception to the right of reproduction, not to any other right, not to the right of uh, communication to the public, reproduction, uh, adaptation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This means that if the results of the tax and data mining activity are either a derivative work or uh, um, a substantial copy of the original, uh, then you cannot communicate those results to the public. And whereas in certain domains, data mining, this is less, it could be an issue, but not that often. In others, those that focus more on text analysis, so for example, natural language processing, it often happens that the model that you build contains maybe not 11, but five consecutive words. Um, five may be not substantial enough, but what if they are eight? Hmm? If they are nine? We know that, again, if we are not familiar, uh, UCJ said that 11 consecutive words could be the author's own intellectual creation, thus a potential infringement is not really the number of words, but whether the message is the core. But how do you translate this into an exception that has to allow you to tax and data mine or not, and we don't know what we can do with the results. So very limited scope, very limited beneficiaries. This is another uh, uh, restriction that, uh, for example, doesn't really uh, go well along with the rhetoric of favoring, for example, quality journalism. Tax and data mining is not available for journalistic purposes, to name one. It's only available for research purposes, and for research organizations. So you have to be a, a, a university, let's say. Um, there is a quite detailed definition of what a research uh, uh, institution is. So once again, uh, differently from other approaches, from other examples that we have in other legal system, this exception will only be available to a very restricted number of beneficiaries for a very restricted, uh, for a very restricted number of purposes. Journalism, parodies, et cetera, et cetera, are not in there. Um, and then the relationship to contracts and to technology. This is something that, again, some, I, I, I often have a hard time to explain. But if we all agree on how important it is to state that the exception cannot be limited by contract, so you cannot have a contract that says the exception is unavailable. If you have that, the exception says this is unenforceable. Great. But then why you allow the same thing from the back door? You apply a TDM that does exactly the, sorry, a TPM, technological protection measure, that does exactly the same thing, that one is fine. There is a missing balance between having the same 
statement expressed to human language, it is forbidden, and expressed to technological language, it is allowed. It doesn't make any sense. Hmm? Now, we do know that with TPM we have a bit of an issue in how we regulate them, but there is a clear problem here because you can easily limit the possibility to tax and data mine through technological protection measures, overcoming the limitation of the contractual overridability. That's a difficult word. I'm not even sure if I Great, said it proper. Um, so just to stay within the time and, and make uh, uh, everyone uh, very happy, especially Martin, who is, uh, well, you, you know. Oh, yeah, I have to, yeah. Okay, yeah, time, yeah, exactly. Time, yeah. Um, these are the main, the main elements that I believe uh, 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 define the exception um, and uh, in, in, in a general assessment are, are not positive. It's too limited as for beneficiaries, as for uses, and there is no a clear uh, limitation of, uh, of what can be done or not in terms of uh, a contractual and technological relationship. So this is bad. What we should have had, if anything, is what was in the original commission proposal option four. So not limited to beneficiaries, not limited to non-commercial uh, activities, but yet we would have still had problems with the reproduction right and with technological protection measures. But the big question that we have to ask ourselves uh, is why do we need the exception in the first place? If, as I said, corporate theory, uh, international agreements are clear that data, facts, uh, principles, methods are not protected by copyright, why do I need an exception? If I need an exception, it means that something along the way has happened and the copyright theory does not correspond to the copyright law any longer. Hmm? And this seems to be the main, the bigger picture that is missed when we have this kind of approach. I do see the pragmatic positive element in, element in having the exception because we clarify an area that otherwise would be gray. However, we have to keep in mind that in this case, we are running the risk of reducing actually the space of, uh, of, uh, for using freely a certain work by introducing not a right, but an exception. So the exception actually is a limitation to what we can actually do with copyright, copyright protected works. Um, so what to do? That's, I think, is the very good question. I think we, today we do need an exception, as broad as, as possible. But what we would really need in order to make you corporate law uh, uh, modern in the real sense of the word and uh, compliant with public interest uh, and fundamental rights is a deep reconceptualization of the entire um, of the entire body of EU law, and in this very specific field, and you know, we have said this so many times, we need a broader exception, a flexible one, one that in two, three, four years' time, when you know we don't have data mining, but we have data farming, we don't have to spend another five years to discuss whether we want to limit it contractually or to limit it technologically. Uh, during at the same time of period, the other uh, uh, legislations and legal systems that are more innovation oriented uh, leave, I think the expression is, uh, uh, leave Europe uh, behind. So that's it, thank you very much. Well, um, thanks to both uh, speakers. Uh, as we have quite a long list of speakers, the idea is of having a, a bit of interaction after um, two presentations, so that's the first moment for interaction. I can imagine that these two topics already raise a couple of questions. At least these are really hot potatoes in the EU reform agenda. So uh, well, any comments, questions, Maya? In part, yes. Uh, but also because we have, uh, I think that the sway generous right to some, to some extent is another manifestation of how EU corporate law has been designed uh, in the 90s and early 20s with uh, very broad uh, and fully harmonized rights. 
uh, which are not, say, Article 2 InfoSoc, so the right of reproduction, the right of communication to the public, the right of um, redistribution, broad, uh, full harmonization. And on the other side, Article 5, exceptions and limitations, narrow, closed list, uh, not mandatory except for one. So there is an inherent balance. There is a design problem. And I think that this design problem is what has been causing a lot of uh, uh, um, problems uh, in the you know in the past uh, fifteen years. Yes, please. Do you think those constitutional challenges are going to be quite obvious in the next third Reich? Do you think it will happen there? Do you know? You're German. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> European Court of Justice. It's it's. I think it's still pending, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, re it's referred to the. Sorry. The hearing is is on the twenty fourth. Yeah, it's referred to the Court of Justice. And the hearing I just hear is on the 24th of October, <laughs> for the record. There, there, there has been a previous uh, competition law case in, in Germany, uh, which, was, which was not successful. If I, if I remember it correctly, uh, the issue there was the question whether um, uh, refusing to take licenses, if you are Google, for example, and you have a dominant position in the market for uh, search services, whether refusing to take licenses, could amount to misuse of your dominant position. If that's what I recall, but that was not successful. Yeah. Yeah. The reference now is really whether they, the, I think the European Union should have been, the Commission should have been notified about the technological regulation. Yeah, it's nothing yeah. to do. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with the proposal as such. It's, it really has to do with the German uh, uh, Leistungsschutzrecht, so the, the German press publisher's right. Uh, in order for the, for the German to adopt that, they should have notified the commission. At least that's the, what the claim is now. So Google filed this petition, and th that's the question that the court has to answer. But it will not affect this right that is now proposed in Europe, because that's another legislative process. Further comments? Astonishing that there are not more questions. Actually, when I first heard about the topics, I mean, you get used to almost everything the, lo the, the more you hear about it. So nowadays, there's been so much of this debate that we get used to what is now on the table. And at some point, you get up in the morning and you think, well, perhaps the world is still okay, <laughs> even if we get a press publisher's right sooner or later. So it, this all feels a little bit messy. Well, that's not right. uh, it seems to me, out of the three that we really see right now, Yeah, it is, it is, in theory, no, in the sense that one of the design principles of behind the article was precisely to fix this potential issue. So the, the exception is mandatory, is detailed enough as to reasonably expect that a member state will implement it almost by the letter, and the definition of what a research organization is is likewise quite detailed. So hopefully this, uh, this will not happen. I, I don't think it will be a major issue. It's true, however, that at least in the uh, parliament, uh, the, 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 last, uh, the latest proposal made by the parliament, there is a second article that would be a broader, slightly broader exception, so not limited to research organizations uh, nor for research purposes, which, however, is only optional and uh, can be contracted out. So if the, the producer of the literary work or you know, whatever you want to mine uh, specifically reserves the right, then it's not mineable. And in theory, you know, that's, that's the exception we would have wanted to, to see, but it has been de-weaponized by introducing the optional and the reservation element. So this could create uh, cross-border uh, issues for sure. Uh, the funny thing is, no, uh, the, 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 the term is not defined. Uh, I also asked that specifically to, 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 to people from the commission. Uh, how did you come up with the term? I said, well, it's, uh, it's, 
we knew that we couldn't go for 50 or 70 years as other related rights. It's a kind of a related, uh, right related to copyright. Other terms are 50 and 70. So they said we, uh, we knew that we had to go significantly below that. Uh, but they, they don't have any evidence why 20 years. Uh, and the same, and the, the, the parliament and the commission, they, have five, they propose five and one. There's also no evidence behind that at all. So, all in all, the evidence is weak. Uh, not only in terms of the of the of the the, the scope of the right, the term of it, but also on the the, the core of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chris Walker, uh, isn't uh, the uh, consideration of principles of It's a very good question. It's also things that, that, that academics have observed. How do you deal indeed with the international framework? In Article 2.8 of the Berne Convention really said news of the day should be free. Yeah, that's clear, clearly written there. Um, so I have no idea. There might be a potentially, a potentially claim for the European Court of Justice. Yes, is this compatible? The, it's written in, in the European directives that the, the, the European corporate law has to abide by the, by the international framework. So. Potentially, yeah, but the commission argues it's the related rights. Related rights are not covered by that. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the argument. But yes, that's but but, but if, then, if so, then you can circumvent everything in the Berne Convention by calling it a related right. Yeah. So I don't find it a real strong argument. Why, why should we keep it before the Court of Justice? We need WTO dispute settlement. So, uh, okay, um, we move on to the next issue in the reform debate. Steph and Thomas, thank you so much. Um, as I have announced earlier, the second part um, is about exceptions, in particular exceptions for educational purposes and exceptions for libraries and archives. And I'm happy that we have specialists for those two areas as well. So I would invite uh, Maya Bogatai Jancic from the Intellectual Property Institute in Ljubljana and Argiri uh, Panesi from uh, Stanford Law School. So please. I should start, and on the end, can you show the, or actually, you can even start. Yeah, okay. No. Just the beginning. Well, I try to be brief. So, the problem that this exception tries to address is that copyright law should be free, uh, should be broad and <laughs> flexible to support modern education and both formal and informal education on site and online. And so, the current copyright system in Europe does not really fit into this picture. It is fragmented because the copyright system, system in Europe are territorial, so it's, it, there's no uh, common European Union law exception um, in this area. And it's, it's narrow, so, and that creates legal uncertainty and, and unnecessary burden for educators. And so EU policymakers recognize that this is a problem, and they recognize that copyright should be fixed in, in, in this direction. Please buy me a new bike. And so the, the parents said, yes, you deserve a new bike. And they bought a new bike 
but the bike had a square wheels. So it is a bike in, in theory, but it's very bad. Um, it's not very good to drive this bike. This is one when we um, uh, read about the exception that EU Commission proposed in uh, 2000, um, 2016, two, two years ago. It was exception for education, but with many flaws. It was quite evident that the, the interests of copyright owners came before the interests of, educate, of educators. So it was the most problematic feature was that the exception that was proposed uh, in, in the second sentence, uh, it could be taken away by member states because it was not mem uh, mandatory. That, that meant that in, in the case if the, if the licenses would be offered on the market, then the member, member state could regulate this sort of a system that then there is no exception uh, in, in that member state. So, um, so what educators wanted, wanted and uh, what we were um, advocating for would be that the exception would be mandatory, so not possible to be overridden by licenses, that it, the whole system would be easy to understand so that the teachers teach not to deal with copyright, and it, that it would be flexible, um, that it would include other organizations, not just um, institutional, educational institu um, institutions, that it would be open for um, different technologies, that also it would be allowed not to um, rely on this exception uh, only in school, but, but also outside of these premises. And because the whole directive and this um, exception for education is Article 4 in this proposal of the directive, <laughs> Um, is aimed to, do, to, um, to um, enhance um, digital single market, that of course it would be the same exception in, in all 28 member states, but that the cooperation in education would be facilitated and it would be enabled it, that it would not be fragmented anymore. And also it's quite important that the, there would be no mandatory remuneration. Currently in the EU, there is um, 17 member states that more or less have a, a free exception to education. So the exception need, need, needs to stay to be fair, but there is also should be option that there is no mandatory remuneration. So as I already said, Commission proposed uh, didn't didn't really um, follow the needs and didn't didn't um, buy a bike with round wheels, but rather with, with square wheels. And the EU Commission proposal was later in the process um, uh, improved. I mean, the, the process is still not, not over and the three institution, EU institutions still needs to agree about the final proposal, but the proposal of the European Parliament did improve a little bit um, what, what's, what's there. And the pluses are now that um, the list of users is extended and now also like uh, cultural her heritage organizations are included so this should i hope this will stay and the exception is um, open to technologies to include secure electronic environments as well and email and cloud services in eu commission that this was not included and also like that now in uh, according to european parliament version also uses um, that take place outside the school and premises are currently um, included, and that the, the potential contractual restrictions for the same reason as you were talking are un unenforceable. So, but of course, and still this remuneration is optional. And so that's also very important. But the main problem, this um, licensing priority is still there. Uh, under the EU Commission pr uh, proposal, under the proposal of the European Parliament, and also under the proposal of the European Council. And um, there are also s uh, several other problems. Um, it's still not, uh, the scope of exception is only uh, dealing with digital uses, and of course it doesn't cover um, uh, informal education and more than 24 million people in Europe also rely on this sort of uh, educational practices. So there is still a uh, huge room to improve. We are far from a really workable bike, and we, um, but some improvements were, were done. And it's worth mentioning that um, in, in the, during the voting on September 12th, there were zero amendments. That was a, a decision on the end. Uh, there were zero amendments 
um, put on the table regarding this Article 4, which on the end turned out well because the members of Parliament really voted down all the good um, improvements um, suggested by several um, advocates that relied on the advices of academia. So if we would open this article, probably these improvements that were um, agreed uh, um, under URI committee would, be, would, would currently not be on the table. So are we happy that the exception is there? Yes. Are we happy with the framing of the exception? Not really. Uh, is there still any room to improve? Well, uh, hope dies on the end, but not really likely. So there, there is still work, a lot of work to do, especially uh, in the phase of uh, implementation that will happen on, on the level of member states and the copyright holders and especially collecting societies are already preparing to, especially on, on, the, on the issue of remuneration also in, other, in all member states, also in those 17 that currently do not have remuneration for educational um, exception. So that's all. Um, thank you so much. Um, we switch from educational institutions to cultural heritage institutions. So, Argiri, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to continue the discussion with, with a very more narrow focus on, on the cultural heritage institutions. And thank you for, for um, um, giving me the floor after, uh, as you said, the hot potatoes of articles 11 and 13 were discussed because this is really the reason why I, I the, the, the uh, lens I want to take. Uh, when I discussed libraries, I was uh, interested in the reform as I'm working on uh, digitization and copyright and, and libraries and cultural heritage institutions and wanted to and have been monitoring the, the proposal. Uh, at some point, I, I felt that it, I, I was looking at a, um, a, a small picture and the picture is, is of course much broader and um, uh, I got more and more interested in the role of libraries and uh, other cultural heritage institutions or memory institutions within this um, uh, debate, within this, um, among all these hot potatoes. Uh, while a lot of stakeholders were, were asking for bikes and were taking less good bikes, etc. And then um, uh, you have um, uh, a, a rather uh, small and, and uh, special category of stakeholders, which are the memory institutions, uh, very much preoccupied to serve the public service, to serve, serve their um, patrons, and also uh, collaborating a lot with all the different stakeholders that were interested in this reform, uh, publishers, uh, media, uh, with the policy makers. And um, I, I want to discuss a little bit more uh, the, the, the position in which they found themselves. I come from the uh, previous panel on that was organized by IFLA members and uh, it was indeed the libraries and, and other cultural heritage institutions discussing how they felt within this reform process. And uh, my initial view that they were kind of caught in the middle of something much bigger than them was confirmed. Um, I was um, looking at the, the tweet feeds and all these announcements coming from IFLA and from Elbida uh, in June and July, and they were very happy with the small um, victories that they had, um, which are quite evident if you look at the, the proposal. So they tried to have e lending there, that this didn't work, but at least there's text and data mining, at least there's some sort of um, compromise in the out of commerce works. And at the same time, we would have very big players, like the Wikimedia Foundation tweeting that the, this reform is going to kill the internet. And, and uh, the, the small victories for the libraries and the cultural heritage institutions become very relative at that point. And it's, uh, I felt that it's uh, a very difficult position that the, the stakeholders, these particular stakeholders had to find themselves in. And uh, all the, I, I would take it one step further as well, that they, um, had to, one, negotiate with partners that they already work with, such as public, or, or the, the rest of the stakeholders, and two, um, perhaps accept that the uh, different dynamics and interests would present the, the reform that uh, is, is rather favorable to cultural heritage institutions as something good, 
in the middle of a very controversial reform and directive. Um, and this is where I wanted to stress the role of uh, really understanding uh, how do cultural heritage institutions come into the, the policy making debate um, in, in, I, I will give two examples from both sides of the Atlantic. In Europe, Europeana is now um, under the consultation, the, the work of Europeana is subject to a consultation period uh, at the EU level, so they would have to, to discuss more at the pu public policy level to see what, what, what they bring to the table and what uh, has been achieved so far in terms of uh, cultural policy from their perspective and what, are, what is the future. Uh, another good example from, uh, from the States, and uh, um, uh, maybe you're all familiar with the Hathi Trust and the Google Books cases and all this the, uh, very important litigation that started 10 years ago, the discussion about uh, digitization. Uh, so I, I see uh, Melissa Levin here in the audience from, from the Michigan Library. She recently wrote uh, an article, uh, a book chapter, discussing uh, Hathi Trust in Michigan uh, um, in their role uh, negotiating with Google when back then they were uh, proposed to, to digitize the collection and how they went about creating the, the, the Hathi Trust Consortium. So these, these players had to um, have a very, are in a very difficult position in both sides of the Atlantic uh, in relying on multiple stakeholders that at the end of the day in, in a reform, in a corporate reform discussion might uh, need to be either their allies or the enemies. And I think that's uh, very important to think about. Um, and I wanted to uh, bring uh, also the, our own community to the table and um, uh, the fact that we are uh, concerned about how is this copyright reform affecting, especially the EU copyright reform, affecting cultural heritage institutions. Uh, maybe you all um, received uh, the email from Joy Karaiganis uh, about the, uh, all the questionnaires the, that um, uh, he distributed in order for participants of this Congress uh, to present their views on various issues, including the EU copyright reform. Um, I added two questions there. They're down. Um, the results are really interesting, so I... I Strongly encourage you to take a look at the whole um, uh, page and the link and to see how groups are formed. Right now there are three uh, interest groups formed from our community uh, in accordance to our uh, replies. So if you scroll down, you'll find question number 63 and 64. Uh, 63 asks whether you think that there is a momentum for... Um, Whether the timing is good for international level reform of copyright exceptions for libraries and other cultural heritage institutions, I'm not very, uh, I'm not able right now to comment on the four groups because they, as as people answer these questions, they, it it quickly changes. There were three groups and five. Right now, I see there are again three. Um, it seems that there is some sort of consensus. More than 50% in each group. Group A, B, and C are the three. The, um, columns that you see there are, are positive, 53%, 75%, 72%, 72%, think that there is a good momentum for libraries to, and uh, other cultural heritage institutions to have a international level uh, reform discussion. And then uh, the second question was a little bit more um, narrow. It had to do with online access, which was not a reform that passed with the EU copyright directive. Um, and there the consensus is, I think, a, a bit less. And it's quite interesting to uh, look at other questions that are, again, relevant to our um, own community's relationship with, with copyright rules and libraries. Um, one of the questions that were, was posed and is quite polarizing is whether uh, scholars use uh, uh, sites like Skyhub. And there you have a very different group saying yes or, and uh, uh, the opposing group is uh, mostly answering that they are um, publishing in Creative Commons, for example. So you have a lot of uh, sort of uh, variety there. And um, uh, Karajganis will um, look at all this data and, and produce better results than my very brief uh, uh, 
uh, review of this here, but I, I, um, I want to um, note it especially um, to, in order to advocate on the basis of the, the story that I came here to tell you that perhaps it is time to uh, discuss more seriously sui's generis rules for cultural heritage institutions and uh, libraries, uh, archives in particular, and museums. Uh, it seems that the issues that we're dealing with are complex enough and deserve um, uh, specific attention enough so that we, are, uh, we don't necessarily put the libraries in this difficult position to um, try to win very small battles in a broader reform that is perhaps much more controversial that they would want to or that they can deal with. Again, thanks to the two speakers. Thank you so much. And uh, as with our uh, last group of speakers, I would open for questions, comments, remarks um, on the two topics we just discussed, so educational institutions and cultural heritage institutions and the EU reform agenda in the air. And before the questions, I forgot to mention before, this is a great resource on the, on the website of Canunia. Uh, can you can you scroll down a little bit? It, it explains um, there there are links to the research done by Teresa Nogra sitting there. It's the whole crew of Co uh, Com of Comunia that was really uh, engaged in copyright for education. So it's really good uh, explanation of the whole problem. So whoever wants to dig in deeper, it's this is a great start. But this shouldn't prevent you from asking questions right now. <laughs> so, uh, if there is anybody. Professor Rankin? Yes, Sarah. I, I, I believe that the understanding or the conversion of the, of the library to the copyright, uh, I think some language about remuneration is not responsive to the understanding of the historian about where the remuneration fits in and what other kinds of. Uh, I don't think that I discussed remuneration. Maybe the adult commerce. Uh, uh, not, not the cultural. Maybe, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I am the word, I think the topic is fascinating. And I was reading an article last week, and there was an author who uh, mentioned that textbooks in the illustrated picture that the, are less affordable here in Germany. Um, this proposal is um, regarding the exception for education in the in, in European Union, and also this exception, which I didn't mention, it's only uh, it's limited in scope, so it's for illustrative purposes. So even under this exception, you could not photocopy or substitute the whole whole te textbook. You would rely on something else. So it's not really solving this problem and although this is a present problem. And also, that's why the, the publisher, especially text, fragile textbook publisher, if I may quote uh, a, a member of European Parliament, Axel Voss, Voss who is a person behind this uh, reform, um, are really fighting uh, against this ex is the exception or forcing the licenses, but collecting societies, organization, see this exception as an opportunity to collect for ad additional uses in school. Yes, Uh, I think perhaps in parallel to the European experience or because the European experience is quite complex and the, the policy making there is quite complex, 
Uh, ICLA has given a lot of resources to, to its presence in UNESCO and WIPO. And I think that WIPO could be, uh, if we we're talking about international level reform, uh, that is more uh, tight to, to their own interests, like the Marques Treaty was, WIPO perhaps would be, would be a good place to... And the, the, talking about momentum and the Marques Treaty, it's uh, quite interesting. I was, uh, uh, we, we were announced that the US indeed um, um, ratified yesterday. Uh, in 2015 or 16, the DPLA festival took place here in Washington, and the big question there was, will the US uh, ratify the Marques Treaty? That was two years ago, and if you look at the history of the Marques Treaty, it's, it goes even in further, further back. So I think that these things also take time. Finding the right moment and, and the right forum is quite important. Regarding the um, copyright exceptions and limitations for educational and research activities, um, hopefully the process um, in WIPO will, will start. And today at four, there is a declaration uh, connected to this issue, and uh, it was uh, Sean uh, uh, invited all of us to support that, and also the experts also sitting in this, this room already drafted the new treaty, which would be called Terra, and hopefully the some positive movement, uh, not in a distant future, um, that we will see a new treaty on exceptions and limitation for education. So there are proposals on the table, nothing officially happening, but hopefully in near future. And Teresa Nobre, again, sitting in the back. Um, Teresa, you could have more uh, information about uh, Terra. Thank you. Oh, well, I would say on this uh, positive note of hope at international level, um, uh, we close this part of the session. Maya and thank you. Adil, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, we move on to the third part. There are a couple of other exceptions that uh, have not been addressed properly um, um, or um, have been included but uh, not fully developed. And we have as a specialist Natalia. Milicic uh, from um, the Centro, uh, Centro, Centrum Cibrove <laughs> hmm, in Warsaw, also belonging to the Communia, Communia uh, Network, uh, speaking about this. Then I would ask Mikel Reguera from the Universitat Oberta de Barcelona, de Catalonia, sorry, um, to uh, speak about another hot potato, we can say, of the reform agenda, um, which is um, the safe harbor for hosting and its future if there is any uh, in the copyright arena. And then adding to that debate, uh, I would abuse my position as a chair and also give a little presentation on the safe harbor question. So I'm Martin Sintrim, Center for the University of Amsterdam. It's not Natalia. different from the French University. Yeah. So the floor is here. Uh, I'll use Here's this some pictures. Microphone, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so far, we heard a lot about things that made it to the proposal or that made Sorry, it to the, the um, position of the European Parliament. Uh, on kind of funny but also sad note, you have to know that European Parliament approved a new right for sport organizers. So if you decide to organize some big sport event, you will uh, be given, probably you would be given, we will see what the outcome of the negotiation, but you will be given probably uh, extra copyright protection for this, so well done, guys. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I wanted to, to, to tell you a little bit about things that didn't make it to the proposal and didn't make it to any negotiation positions that are going to be discussed dur during trialogue that is about to start uh, in two days. And um, in, in two years ago, when we so the first draft of the, okay, okay, when the draft was officially published by the European Commission, 
we are like, okay, you know, this is not something we are waiting for. We don't have harmonization of uh, limitations and exceptions. We are not discussing any kind of open norm or fair use in Europe, of course, that's impossible. Uh, so at least let's try to add something to, to the directive itself and to make it a little bit more user friendly and a little bit more common sense friendly. Because uh, I would like uh, to invite you all to think a little bit about traveling to Paris. Uh, probably some of you have uh, been there. Uh, can you put the first photo, please? Thank you, Heidi. So uh, if you go to Paris, of course, you can see beautiful Tour Eiffel. You can take a photo of, of this beautiful building. And this photo during daytime, you can post online. This is, this is pretty OK. But afterwards, you know, you have a walk uh, during nighttime. You enjoy Paris. You have some wine. And then you take another picture. And to be on the safe side with copyright, you have to post on Facebook picture like the second one, please. There are only three, thanks. So this is it, because of course, to Rafael itself, it's outside public domain. It's it's long enough in public space to be outside public domain. But uh, the way it is lighting up, the lightening of to Rafael, I don't know if you knew about this. Uh, it's copyrighted, and to be on the safe side, and as as copyright scholars, you probably want to follow all the rules always. You simply cannot publish uh, the photo of, of to Rafael uh, by night uh, on your social media because this is copyright infringing, act, uh, infringing activity. And um, so this is something we as civil society, especially Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Dimi who is sitting over there, uh, we are trying to achieve and to, to, to get introduced into new bill. Something this is so common sense nowadays to have to have freedom of panorama. So the exceptions that let everyone to take photos and to use photos of public uh, spaces, of public areas, even if copyrighted work uh, works are there because they're everywhere. It's not only about lightening of to refer, it's about uh, street art, it's about, it's about contemporary art that is placed on the streets. Um, and of course, this, this exception is introduced in many countries. Uh, we have it in Poland, pretty broad one, for example. But then you go to Paris, or then you go, for example, to Greece, or you go to, to Italy, that is even worse case. And you simply can't follow the rules. You see, we will simply at the end breach copyright. So in, in our idea, it's something that shouldn't be happening. So, you know, of course, there are some interests to be taken into account, but in this case, in Freedom of Panorama, um, Wikimedia in Italy asked several hundreds of architects if they ever seen any piece of, you know, any euro, any penny for, for this exception, any remuneration for this, and one of them saw it a few years ago, you know, some like five euros or something like this. So, you know, what's the economical sense of this? Like, we simply cannot understand it. And we wanted to make uh, a law a little bit more suitable for the way uh, users are simply using uh, internet nowadays and they are using uh, other people's creativity. So this is the first example and it didn't make it to any of negotiation positions. So, you know, I believe in miracles, but in this case, miracle won't happen. So we won't have uh, harmonized uh, and obligatory freedom of panorama exception in Europe, unfortunately. And can I get the... And now I'm breaching copyright. But, um, so uh, this meme is probably copyright infringing in many countries because it's, it's based, of course, on the photo taken by somebody showing, like depicting a kid having very grumpy face. Uh, so yes, the culture of remix, the culture of memes, the culture of, um, of you know, of uh, making like lip dub songs, for example, making uh, videos put out of uh, many other pieces of videos and many other things. And uh, we don't have it harmonized in Europe, and that's why uh, we suggested and we proposed something called user-generated user exception for copyrighted works. 
So what we claimed was that if you have access to something and the, if you are remixing it, like using partially, if you are quoting something for the purpose of parody, for the, uh, for the sake of commentary, but also, uh, also for entertainment, like, you know, and unless you have benefit, you have economic benefits out of it, you should be able to use it without asking for the permission. And of, like in Poland, again, in Poland, I can post such meme online and it's okay, but in many countries, um, this exception is simply not harmonized. And this was something we were, uh, we were kind of asking, we were advocating for. And again, it didn't happen. So um, it refers back to the comment we had already uh, during this session, it shows kind of, you know, in balance approach to copyright because I am well aware that both freedom of panorama and user generated content are not the most important intellectual property issues nowadays. And probably people will use Facebook as they are using Facebook and they will be breaching copyright as, as they are doing it right now. Um, and, you know, nobody will go to jail for this or anything. But the thing is that it shows like the lack of will of European uh, institutions to address like very basic and common sense needs we have nowadays. And um, so yeah, we had also the third very, very small request and it made it to, uh, this made to, uh, to the version approved by European Parliament. So uh, safeguards for public domain. So in the version approved by the European Parliament, um, it says that uh, whatever is in public domain, if, if you make reproduction of it, you cannot claim copyright for this. So this is, you know, something, again, very small victory, some very common sense thing to add to the legislation. But then it will make the, e the, the life of many users so much easier. So I still, you know, cannot understand why Freedom of Panorama and user-generated content didn't make it. So maybe uh, if anyone uh, of you knows the answer, I'm happy to, to listen to it. But yeah, that's, that's everything for now. Thanks a lot. And we stay in the area of user-generated content, um, but we switch the perspective. So uh, this was about the exception for the user himself. And now another question is, of course, what about the platforms uh, like YouTube and so on, where all these user-generated content creations are finally uploaded and the liability for infringing content that is among the uploads. And Mikel, for first introduction. Thank you very much, Martin. So I will give us uh, some kind of introduction and then the, the real <laughs> analysis will come after that. Uh, but yeah, well, uh, um, I will try to stick to the 10 minutes time. Is that okay? Um, well, the general idea behind, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I assume uh, most of you are familiar with Article 13 uh, of the proposal that um, e essentially obliges uh, either to get a license or uh, if you are not covered by a license, you uh, as a platform, uh, to uh, prevent the availability of uh, infringing copyright, uh, copyright content uh, which has been uploaded by users. Well, to, mm, I would like to, to mm, give some highlights and to comment on the situation um, today after the uh, 12th of September uh, vote in the parliament. Um, so the idea uh, as, a, as a justification for this proposal um, was uh, the perceived uh, value gap between uh, the profits that platforms uh, make and the lack of profits, in theory, uh, um, made by content uh, providers uh, because um, the habits of consumption nowadays uh, have shifted a lot towards uh, platforms and people go to YouTube to, uh, uh, to see videos or to listen to music uh, instead to all platforms. And uh, um, the 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 main um, message of the of the article is uh, these online sharing platforms like YouTube they are communicating to the public uh, so they are performing uh, uh, an act of exploitation which is reserved to the um, uh, copyright owner uh, and thus they must um, 
obtain a license to carry out this communication, which com uh, meaning the uh, uh, communication of the um, uh, contents that have been uploaded by the users, right? And what if they don't get that um, uh, license? Well, in that case, the obligation is to uh, avoid the availability of those content by um, implementing recognition technologies. That was the language in the proposal, which is uh, now uh, is no longer there as such because that's, that, that that language was very controversial. But still, the idea is. Uh, in, is always uh, still there because now we have uh, proportionate measures, but with the same um, goal, which is to, to uh, prevent the availability of specific content, which means to filter it out. Um, well, th this challenges um, the very notion of the safe harbor, the hosting safe harbor, because that, uh, that um, safe harbor, uh, which is uh, set forth in the e-commerce directive, exempts from liability the, those who host uh, user uploaded content for any kind of infringement, including copyright infringement. And, um, and, and also challenges the prohibition of general monitoring obligations established also in, in the e-commerce directive, Article uh, 15. Um, there is, of course, some room for discussion on which are the conditions to get um, protected by the safe harbor, the threshold conditions that the ECJ has uh, um, proposed as um, a neutrality test, which is doubtful whether specifically the, um, the directive uh, really establish, establishes. And then uh, also, um, there, is, there may be some room for discussion on what entails a general monitoring obligation as opposed to a specific kind of uh, monitorings, uh, uh, um, monitoring obligations. But, um, well, basically, the, um, the initial proposal was uh, particularly um, confusing regarding the interplay uh, with the e-commerce directive because it was um, saying in a recital that uh, you uh, would need to have a license unless you qualify for the safe harbor. And then um, even if, uh, um, so if, if you are active enough and, and thus you don't qualify for the safe harbor, you must obtain a license. But then even if you do qualify, you still would have this obligation to filter out uh, content, which uh, would really go against uh, the whole idea of the e-commerce directive mm, because of this prohibition of general monitoring obligations. So first problem is this um, clash or, or difficult uh, uh, interplay with the e-commerce directive. And second is the notion of communication to the public as such, uh, because Communication to the public is um, a, a difficult notion that the ECJ has said many times that must be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, it was not clearly uh, concluded or it was not clearly tested whether a service like a YouTube platform or some other uh, similar platforms are in fact performing an act of communication to the public. And the reasoning uh, that the proposal made is that if you are active enough not to be covered by the safe harbor, then you are communicating to the public. This is kind of a too big a step to, to, to be clearly uh, acceptable. But so n now after uh, the September 12th vote, we have uh, some differences between the, the parliament's position and the initial uh, proposal by the Commission, and the Parliament's position uh, is mm, uh, it goes very much in parallel with the uh, uh, Council, but for some aspects. I will just briefly highlight some. In the Parliament now, there is a new exception or a new, yeah, new specific exception to permit legitimate uh, uses of extracts uh, of pre-existing protected works um, um, in content that is uploaded by users. So users 
um, will be able, if this is approved, to, to upload um, content that somehow quotes or uses some pre-existing protected material. But the platform won't be able to um, rely on that exception, exception to avoid the uh, obligations under the new Article 13. Mm, then uh, I'm, I'm go very quickly, but the, uh, it has been defined what a platform is uh, for the mm, uh, purposes of this article, and it's uh, called an online content sharing service provider. Um, there is a tweak there because the new version of the parliament says those who store and give access to the content or uh, stream content, like if it was possible or if it was referring to streaming without storing at the same time. This is a tricky point that uh, um, I don't know exactly uh, where, where, where it's heading to. But then um, it tries to restrict uh, the applicability of these obligations to those providers who are active and um, try to enshrine in, in, in a positive text the, um, the, the interpretation of the e-commerce e e directive by the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice has said that you need to be neutral and you won't be neutral if you optimize or promote the uh, user uploaded content. And we, we are not sure what that really means. Uh, it was really, uh, referring to eBay and to Google AdWords. Uh, but here, uh, clearly, the, mm, the new directive would make a, uh, um, the decision of considering any typical activity of a platform like YouTube as an optimization or promotion, and thus uh, it concludes that this is active uh, involvement and, and it is explicitly it, it falls outside the um, safe harbor. So this is explicitly said, and there is a doubt whether this actually entails to, a, to an amendment or to a correction to the uh, e-commerce directive. And then um, uh, there, there, was, um, there is also this uh, explicit recognition that if you are uh, within this definition of an active uh, platform, uh, I say use platform to be more brief, uh, mm, you are communicating to the public and this clashes again with, um, with, with the idea of, the, of, mm, of how the InfoSoc Directive is being interpreted. Then there are some uh, elements on uh, promoting collaboration, but I, I won't tackle on that and just want to mention to, to, to finish um, that the council position uh, goes a little bit farther and specifically uh, talks uh, about uh, um, uh, kind of deactivates the, say, the hosting safe harbor uh, by saying that when you are communicating to the public, you are not covered by the safe harbor, but you may still be covered by the safe harbor for other kind of infringing activities not related to copyright. And this is very interesting to uh, consider because the hosting uh, safe harbor is horizontal. It's meant to cover uh, any kind of liability. So uh, here the, 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 the text in this, okay, in, in, in this occasion, the council considers that there is a requirement which was built in the um, e-commerce uh, e hosting safe harbor, but would only function for copyright. That's, uh, well, I'm just pointing that out. And then the council um, version includes an additional safe harbor, says, okay, you won't be covered by the old safe harbor, but we are um, creating a new safe harbor. And the first condition of that one will be that you have been, you, you have the obligation to filter in the first place, reasonably filter. And then only if you have been filtering, which is prohibited under the e-commerce uh, directive, then uh, you must also uh, comply with the condition of removing content once you've been notified about it. And this is a kind of an introduction, um, excuse me for going a little bit.
Well, um, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, this, this overview of the uh, legislative design. Um, I would just like to add to the debate by uh, pointing out uh, some of the main discussion topics that have arisen in this uh, debate about the safe harbor. Well, as uh, Mikel has said, it's, it's quite a remarkable step. So basically, uh, what the legislator in the EU is trying to do, well, abandoning the knowledge criterion which in the past has regulated the liability of online platforms. And this knowledge criterion is something we do not only know in Europe, but this has been a general feature, whether you take US doctrinal approaches or other regions. It has always been the knowledge of um, the platform that makes you a secondary infringer and can be a basis for your liability. And now the EU would basically abandon this traditional approach and would say, well, we put something completely different in its place, and this is a specific, a square meter of a specific exclusive right. So copyright owners in the EU would get a separate exclusive right against online platforms with regard to whatever content is uploaded to such a platform. So, I mean, it has been felt in the debate that this is really a remarkable step. As a platform provider, you would then basically be strictly liable for whatever is uploaded by any user, which of course would neutralize the very uh, objectives underlying the safe harbor, because the safe harbor has always been intended as a means to stimulate um, the evolution of electronic commerce and new platforms, which everybody believed it's only possible if you take away this liability risk unless knowledge is present. Well, um, and as Mikael has also pointed out, of course there are two escape avenues. So if you are confronted with this liability risk, you can reduce this and um, one is an obvious thing. Of course you can license instead. I mean, that's the general, this is something that's not really even necessary to point out in the legislation if you are confronted with um, potential copyright infringement, then you can seek a license and you can minimize that risk. Or the second option is uh, you do filtering, which is not explicitly mentioned, but is underlying the legislative design. So if you look at these two options, just um, in a bit more detail, licensing, and this is something which is, is um, yeah, quite interesting to see, um, brings us back to Adam and Eve in a sense, um, EU legislators uh, like to rely on a licensing approach. There is this um, fetishism that um, you can solve copyright issues by just um, asking for licenses and that um, uh, industry will do this and come to conclusions. I think it's just a fig leaf. In, in, in particular, um, when you look at how difficult these licenses are to obtain in a European Union with 27 well, 28, sorry, 28, soon 27 uh, member states and a diversity of cultures and, and languages and so on. And there's another feature, um, and the feature is that the proposed legislation says the license which the platform wishes to obtain shall cover whatever content will be uploaded by users. And that's, of course, extra delicate. So imagine the situation, you are the platform provider, you go to somebody who can grant your license, who is willing to grant a license, and the licensor will, will ask, okay, for what are you seeking a license? And then you say, well, um, actually, I don't know precisely, because I don't know what my users will upload in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or something. So you would need an umbrella licensing deal, um, which is an enormous rights clearance task, of course. And, um, well, if you think of partners for this umbrella licensing deal, then collecting societies in a way enter the picture naturally. I mean, in principle, they could offer umbrella licenses, but they are driven by their members. And the question is whether the members or the rights owners themselves, the individual authors or the industry representatives are willing to grant these licenses because platforms will not only ask for the license, they will also ask for an indemnification against outsider claims. If you want this umbrella license and you are willing to pay for this, you want to be on the safe side. Yeah, I mean, there's no use in um, getting the license first and being sued afterwards by somebody who has not been a member of the collecting society granting this. And uh, so the question is very much whether collecting societies are flexible enough in that area. When we look at solutions that we try to find in Europe for the orphan works problem, then um, these experiences are not very encouraging, to say the least. And then, of course, there is the elephant in the room, and this is, um, well, um, 
there's not just one licensing body um, in the European Union of 28 member states. And then when you also think about the diversity of content, so if it's audiovisual content in the Netherlands, for example, you would need to negotiate with the collecting society for the directors, for um, uh, the composers, for the scenario writers, for uh, the actors, and so on and so forth. And this is just one member state. So um, I think it is fair to say that um, this will be very difficult. And the risk seems to be that we move from the open participative web that we currently enjoy um, to online platforms that resemble much more traditional TV channels in the sense that you can only upload remixes and reuses of content in respect of which the platform has managed to obtain a license and also perhaps only in those member states where this is possible, which could lead to a fragmentation. Um, perhaps um, operators in the EU um, would choose the bigger markets and would say, well, okay, if you conclude licenses uh, with German collecting societies, we can cover several member states and a big territory, whereas the Baltic states are perhaps not that attractive because it's much smaller in terms of population and potential market and so on. So this is quite um, a difficult um, and, and not very promising scenario. So what about filtering? Um, well, Mikel has pointed out correctly that um, you don't find the word filtering in the legislative text. They have removed this, but the omission of the word filtering does not mean that this is not the very purpose. So if you want to reduce the risk um, of liability and you can't conclude licenses, then you have to take measures in order to make sure that illegal content is not uploaded in the first place. And um, we have this decision of the Court of Justice in the Scarlet Sabam case where the court considered the different fundamental rights involved, freedom of expression, privacy, freedom of conducting a business, and of course the um, property guarantee that covers also copyright. And the court said, well, even though there is this guarantee of copyright as a fundamental property, um, the general filtering um, that was at issue in this case is irreconcilable with fundamental rights. So the question is whether the reform scenario we are now discussing is different from the general filtering that was at issue in Scarlet and Sabam. Um, the EU legislators say, no, it is not, because it is not general in any way. Um, the filtering is only necessary with regard to those works that are specifically pointed out by the rights owners. Well, what will the rights owners do? Well, if, if I was EMI, I would send the platforms a list of all the works I have in my repertoire, and this will be quite a long list. And then if, as a platform provider, you, re you receive those lists from all the content majors, then, okay, you have individual notices, perhaps, of protected works, but the effect at the end of the day is very much the general um, filtering um, that was discussed in this case. And um, there's another point that is striking um, in the European Union, which insists so much on um, fundamental freedoms, freedom of expression, and so on. Um, it's striking to see that the whole issue of um, taking care of these fundamental freedoms is outsourced to industry roundtables. So there is much reliance on industry cooperation. Who takes care of the public interest? Well, the EU legislator seems to be confident that the creative industry and the online platform industry when sitting at the table and negotiating these filtering and licensing solutions and so on, they will take reasonable measures and they will act diligently. And I believe they will do, but they will act reasonable and diligent from the perspective of economic businesses. So it's not fundamental rights, it's efficiency considerations and how to make this possible um, with um, not much investment and so I think um, the public interest is not really safeguarded here. Of course, there are complaint and redress mechanisms for users, um, but studies, also studies here in the US, have shown that these kind of countermeasures are not very effective. If you are a user and you see that your upload just never ends up at the platform, perhaps you just stop there and you don't send a complaint and you wait for a reply and then you argue your case. I mean, if your video doesn't go viral today, then perhaps the moment is over and you just move on and you try something else. So whether these complaint and redress mechanisms for users are really something that should give us hope is um, really a question. Um, another big issue in the debate has been that um, the EU legislator quite clearly said we want to hit the big industries, in particular Google. I mean, that was quite, quite obvious. Um, actually, 
the critical commentators believe that this will not hit Google because the big industry players like Google, they already have sophisticated filtering systems in place. So Google is known for having the content ID system on YouTube and so on. Perhaps they even have a new market. They can sell these content filtering systems to others in the market. Um, but it will be quite a challenge for smaller players, EU uh, participants in the uh, online market, for example. They have to acquire these filtering mechanisms in the first place. Um, the proposal that is now on the table tries to take care of this by saying there is a privilege for small and medium and micro enterprises. Um, so it remains to be seen to which extent this, this really helps. Um, but that's another issue that could lead to quite some debate. So this is what I wanted to add in order to inform you about the discussion points. Um, we have about 15 minutes left. I, I would invite all the speakers. So we have six chairs here and I can stand. So I would invite all the speakers and uh, would open up to a, for, uh, a short applause for this uh, last <laughs> So I would open for a final round of um, questions, comments, whatever you always wanted to know and never dared to ask about the reforms. Martin. I'd like to play devil's advocate. So, um, some reading, you know, YouTube probably had it coming as, as a reference from the German BGH um, now, you know, asking essentially whether YouTube you know, is within the communication public. Um, and they ask precisely those questions here, whether, you know, by, by offering preference lists that, um, mm. essentially that they promote and, and uh, optimize. So that's the last of the questions being asked. So, so if that uh, reference in the European Court of Justice formulates uh, uh, guidance um, that you, what YouTube is doing is primary infringement, we more or less are in the situation the directive suggests. Do you agree or not? Well, on, on this development of the law, yes, I think. And so, so is, there, is there a possible future in which basically the case law of the European Court of Justice and what the directive says basically end up in the same spot? Well, there, there is, but when, when we look at the, at the past cases that have led to this uh, starting point for the prejudicial questions, now uh, we see that the court has always insisted on the knowledge criteria. So we had this in the Brian Filmspaler case and also in the um, uh, Pirate Bay case where, where the court very clearly said um, our starting point for saying this is a primary act of infringement is the knowledge criteria. So this is where I still see a difference between um, making it explicit that it falls under the control of copyright owners and the question whether you have sufficient knowledge. Of course, I agree that if the knowledge criterion is lowered to such an extent that even um, order, yeah, even structuring your website in a particular way is already sufficient for assuming knowledge, then you have pretty much the same situation. And could the, the court then um, in a way already interpret what the new online sharing service provider is at a knowledge requirement so that so the meaning of the directive is okay so yeah could they basically just you know force the two things back together i mean that's my well this last i'm, I'm not so sure if um if, if this last thing if the court could forged this link even before the new legislation has formally been enacted. Basically, the moment the new legislation... Yes, no, no, they couldn't yet. Yeah, but of course, the, the court could already anticipate so much that you have pretty much, yeah, you, you have a transition from court-made law to um, legislation that says pretty much the same thing. Can, can, I, can I add something? Uh, for, for me, because I, I also agree with your, with your observation, but is, wouldn't that be an extra reason to be very cautious of adopting a new Article 30 now, especially if you introduce specific carve-outs for specific types of players? That we also don't know what, what case law, future case law of the European uh, uh, the, of the Court of Justice will say about that. So that's, it's a bit like, it's like the legislator already wants to introduce uh, uh, similar ideas as what the case law might predict, or what we predict the case law might be, um, but uh, already says, okay, but these types of players are carved out. I don't, I don't know whether that's sustainable in, 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 
in, in the future. Further comments from the uh, No, just, uh, uh, well, well, if you have new legislation, then the court must uh, kind of withdraw uh, in relation with uh, the, the, the type of players that have been excluded from, from this. Uh, but yeah, there's also the, the yeah, some of the materials that are behind this proposal actually were provided by the court. This idea of the neutrality, if you are active by promoting, or uh, then you are not covered by the safe harbor. But um, I think there's an idea that sometimes is confused, is uh, whether or not the safe harbor covers both indirect but also direct infringement. So. Uh, even if you are actually performing as a platform an act of communication, um, you uh, won't be liable unless you have knowledge. So, so this is the, the knowledge element that Martin was referring to. That is not that much, uh, as, I, uh, as, uh, as I understand it, uh, related to an element of an act of communication, except for this specific kind of um, uh, field of hyperlinking, which is a has been a novelty, but uh, as an element to be um, to be devoid or to be excluded from the operation of the of the safe harbor. Further questions, Jerry. Yeah. notion of thinking in the most objective uh, rock crawling is one of brewing that thing is objective and uh, the end result has been very successful and you keep refining the end result you keep refining the knowledge requirement and it seems to be working very well why why has how how do you explain the fact that this has come through the back door somewhere and and, and appeared when it was rejected by the international community explicitly in the Mindful copyright treaty well, I, I guess the, the, the idea finally was um, the, the value gap argument. The idea was that now, my poor copyright treaty was in 96. At the time, everybody thought that something had to be done for um, the evolution of electronic commerce. But nowadays, the pendulum has swung back, and uh, we see that the online platforms have become very powerful players, and that the creative industry has difficulty um, getting remuneration for the use that is made online. So that basically um, the power play had to be restructured. So the well, position is different. I understand it. They have said, well, it's these uh, uh, the latest statistics that I saw that they were able to pick out infringing uh, matter in, in, in such a, an incredible rate. Uh, there was no, no delay whatsoever on the, on the notice to take down. And they were perfectly, I would have thought, the opposite, I would have thought that there may be minor difficulties, but they're opposite. I mean, they're able to, find, to, to play through hundreds of thousands of, uh, 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 play thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in, in, in a pursuit of, of life. But where, why are they getting hurt? Where is the, where is the, the damage that is requiring such a radical uh, change of everything that was done in, 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 in through the Michael Copyright Treaty? Well, I, also that uh, today you're successful if you get attention. In the copyright world is you get fame. So I think it's not about being taken down, but it's about getting remuneration. And this is the goal of the, uh, of the industry joined with collecting society, which is industry in itself. And in current copyright reform Europe, also with the strength and voice of publishers and journalists, unfortunately. So with all these rhetorics joined, the political, the, the corporate pressure of these industries and the very strong rhetoric that this is about defending European culture persuaded to, to, to move with such a high speed without considering and taking in consideration all the warnings of academia and doing all the rethinking that you did back in, in those times and, you, and just opening the door for this novelty. Um, to do this 
diagnosis is also interesting to follow the discussions on a smaller round table that I followed in Slovenia, in Slovenia, which was like collecting society and artists claiming, oh, we won from 14 and 16, we don't really want Article 13, or we don't want to be taken down, we just want to be paid. And then this rhetoric was like extremely, uh, extremely successful. And so unfortunately, I mean, I, I don't know which academic uh, academia really supports the current version version of the article 14 and and also like it's the the current version is not really the the balanced version it's the it's a great playing ground for academia to say i've told you so for for the future but it's really uh, worrisome what will bring not only in europe but also elsewhere i think but the problem is real, this pressing problem that creators, individual creators, are not remunerated by YouTube, if you want. But is this the, the, the good solution forward? We would all agree not. But there is a huge and strong group that manages to join all these forces currently in Europe that, that demands that, and they, they are successful. I have Natalia and Tom. Yeah, I would add also that um, monitoring works. It, it's like according to the industry, it works. We have YouTube, we have Content ID, and they're pretty uh, satisfied with the outcome. And they don't care that uh, suddenly Beethoven's uh, you know, music pieces are taken down because somebody claims uh, he's the author of Beethoven's, apparently, uh, who, who died many years ago. So, um, yeah, and as, as Maya said, that's, uh, that's the first thing, it works, and secondly, they want to be paid, so that's why they got to this conclusion that you should combine this licensing obligation with filtering uh, to, to support licenses themselves, and you'll have a great system to get money from the, from the market, and like, what, if, it's, if it works on YouTube, why... We want. We would like to put it on every single platform that is user-generated uh, content sharing platform. So it's as simple as that, I would say. So yeah, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, and uh, obviously, in, in 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 addition to that, uh, um, I mean, we have seen throughout the history of uh, corporate lawmaking that uh, venue shopping is a pattern. Um, you know, you try to pass uh, a certain uh, legislation or right in some venue, it doesn't work. You try it a different one next time, it doesn't work. You try a different one next time, and because that third time or fourth it's popular, because it attracts attention, because there is value gap, because whatever variable it's present, then it makes it true. And, you know, we have seen these both successful uh, examples and, and, and failures with TPM, with soy generous database right, with you know many examples. So I believe there is a pattern there on how you know we try to uh, how certain modification into corporate law are being passed. It's certainly very close to the original EU proposal when they walked in the door at the whiteboard copyright treaty, but they didn't get anywhere. So it's coming back to the back door, I guess. Okay. You know, a, another fact is remember that uh, the closed list was at some of exception was at some point proposed during a diplomatic uh, meeting of the Bern Convention and was rejected for being too restrictive, and they implemented the first version of the three-step test. So there were two alternative measures. Article five implements both. So you know. With the pass of time, then the rationale just you know adapts to a different uh, situation, and you end up with a completely different solution. I have an additional question for Article 14 experts. If the way forward is going to be um, something like Article 14 or whatever uh, the European Court of Justice is um, envisioning, is the way forward to really establish a strong duty to respect limitation and exceptions? That strong duty on, on platforms or on, on right holders, that they would be interested to design mechanism that would not just make identification of the content, 
but would understand the context, would understand what is fair use, <laughs> and then uh, remove only what should be removed and would yeah. keep intact what is um, allowed according to the copyright law. And how to, how to um, enforce, how to give the right incentive that this would be the future of this sort of mechanism. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if we can believe Eva Elkin Corin in her talk this morning, she said the answer to the algorithm is yes. in the algorithm. So uh, we, would, we would have to um, uh, look for solutions that implement fair use exceptions into this process of filtering. I don't know if this is possible in the, in, in, in the short term. And I think the, the legislation that we have at the moment does not provide these incentives because um, as I see it, as I just said, it's, it's more or less outsourcing the problem to industry roundtables. And I think there is no player at the table who is genuinely interested in um, investing in these things. Um, so I, I think some further encouragement could do no harm, even though to be fair, the legislation says quite clearly that the whole process is of course subject to the exceptions and limitations. So it is not a legislation that overlooks the whole point and says um, we, we forget about exceptions and limitations in this matter. Well, um, we could take one very, very... Yes, Natalia, please. Uh, what worries me with such an approach that I believe will be our future, unfortunately, <laughs> Is, is the fact that we face privatization of law enforcement and like we, we still have no idea how to tackle this and it's not only in copyright but if you look at for example uh, new regulation proposed by the European Union regarding um, uh, regarding measures to counter fight uh, terrorist content it's exactly the same thing so they are like kind of European Union is saying, we don't know how to deal with this, and the internet is kind of, you know, uh, too too um, too sophisticated, and we simply don't have measures to tackle those issues. So, please, platforms, you are the one that are efficient. Take care of this. But you know, with this efficiency, probably fundamental rights uh, angle will be simply missed somewhere in the process. I just hope to to end on some positive note. Um, <laughs> so. Um, Thank you, thank you all for, for spending almost two hours with us on the EU copyright reform. Uh, I hope you agree that uh, we had a wonderful, um, we had wonderful speakers giving us a good overview of the issues at the table. And uh, thanks so much for coming. Yes, I'll try.